and get rid of the message on your screen and then away we go. So, um, so I'm really happy to be here tonight and I am the um, senior naturalist at Wiz Tech and Trails and I just want to take a moment to talk a little bit about who we are. I hope um, that a lot of you have at least heard our name if you're not exactly familiar with what we do. Um, we are based right in Ambler, um, right around the corner from the library actually. And um, we've been in the area for a little over 60 years. Uh, we were founded by a group of concerned citizens um, to help protect the land and the water of the upper part of the Wissahickon Creek. So we operate in Montgomery County. Um, we are a nonprofit and we have um, to date saved about 1300 acres of land from development. And on that land, we have 12 nature preserves and about 24 miles of trails that are open to the public. Um, and so we encourage you to come out and um, use the trails and use the preserves and get out and see what you can do. Um, there's several trail accesses um, from right in Ambler and um, we have hikes throughout the year that help you find other trail accesses if that's something that you're interested in doing. Uh, as well as a lot of other nature programs and public outreach that we do, like this program tonight. Um, since we are a nonprofit, we do rely on our supporters to help us continue our mission. Uh, and if you are a current supporter who is on the call tonight, I thank you personally. Uh, we couldn't do this without you. And if you're not a supporter uh, and you're looking for a way to kind of get involved in some activities in your community, take a look at our website, wisdicontrails.org. Uh, there's interactive trail maps on there. There's a lot of information about the various projects that we do um, beyond the things I'm going to talk about tonight. So, um, you know, take a look at that and see if there's things in there that might encourage you to become a supporter or come out to some of our programs and learn a little bit more about what we are all about. So for tonight, um, I kind of have sort of three main buckets, if you will. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what is community science, uh, and then we're going to talk about some of the projects that we have, and I've kind of grouped them into two buckets, the on your own kinds of things and the group things, and I'll explain a little bit more about that um, when we get there. And then there's sort of another category of, of help that we can use within community science, and that's project support, and so I'm going to talk about that and then wrap up um, the evening with some next steps. And so, you know, what to do if one of these projects speaks to you and you'd like to help out. Um, and we'll, we'll end uh, with that this evening. So let's start off just with what is community science? Um, the term citizen science, and we're going to speak more about the names in a second. Citizen science first entered into the Oxford English Dictionary in 2014. And you can see the official definition here. Um, but really, we're talking about sort of this idea of amateurs, not trained scientists um, undertaking scientific work. And usually under the direction of scientists or scientific institutions. Um, and even though this term citizen science didn't end up in a dictionary until 2014, um, the idea of amateurs conducting scientific research is actually really not a new one. Uh, and we'll we'll talk about that in a in a second, but um, it's really been going on for a long, long time, even if it wasn't named as such. And we saw a great increase in programs uh, in the 1990s, especially with the widespread use of the internet. So word could get out that people were looking for help. There was you know a lot of computer based projects that people could help researchers with. Um, you can help NASA like look for stars on your computer, that kind of thing. And now there's a, this is just a small snippet, but there is a plethora of opportunities um, for people to get involved with scientific research in a variety of different ways. Um, some of it you can do right from your desk and some of it like a lot of what we're going to talk about here tonight is actually out in the field um, and collecting data um, on the ground from the plants and creatures that are on some of our preserves. And I just want to make a note about the name. So by and large, a lot of times you'll still see this as uh, citizen science um, and people refer to it as citizen science. In the past few years, the term citizen has kind of taken on an entirely different meaning. 
And so a lot of groups who are using this kind of projects within their organizations um, are trying to find friendlier words um, than citizen because citizen has the tendency to try to exclude people and we don't want to do that. Um, this is about everybody being able to participate at the heart of it and we really want to make sure that people understand that. So another popular term that groups are using is community science. Um, but you can see there's crowd science, crowdsource science, civic monitoring, volunteer monitoring, which at the heart of it, that's really what we're talking about here is volunteer monitoring. Um, but we're using the term community science so that we can make sure that we are sort of under that umbrella of, of inclusivity. Um, I'm going to use community science here tonight in a lot of my words, um, but you might see uh, other groups refer to this as citizen science, and we're probably all talking about the same thing. So if we look, so again, there's the, the idea of citizen science isn't really a new one. Um, up until the late 19th century, especially through the end of the 19th century, much of science was in fact done by amateurs. Most were not trained as scientists. Um, they pursued research because they had some level of interest in something, um, a particular creature or organism or a question that they decided that they wanted to answer. And we can look at some of these folks that you might recognize their names. Charles Darwin uh, wrote The Origin of Species, Henry David Thoreau and his work at Walden Pond. Aldo Leopold is kind of the founder of ecological conservation work um, and published a book that is almost required reading in our field, The Sand County Almanac, um, that detailed a lot of the sort of data collection that he and his family, his children did on his own property um, in Wisconsin. And all those studied a little bit more in the sciences, but Walden and Charles Darwin, in fact, did not. Um, Charles was, you may not know this, but he actually dropped out of medical school and eventually graduated a program that was designed to help him become a minister um, in the Anglican church. And then he went on a boat and, you know, founded the, you know, formed this collections, observations, the basis of what is now this fundamental concept of evolution um, in science and, and in, in biology. And so the idea that amateurs can contribute meaningfully to science is one that has a great history. Uh, and we want to continue to sort of encourage that. What we see now is sort of this transition, and that's where you saw in that initial um, definition, it's like more of under the guidance of somebody, a scientist, a researcher who has a specific question who wants to get data, um, or a scientific community that wants to uh, pursue a particular question. And most projects now kind of have four common features. Um, anyone can participate, as I said. The idea is you do not have to have specific training. Um, any training that you need is provided on the job, so to speak. Um, all participants in any given study are using the same protocol. So that data can be combined to be um, very good and, and uh, high quality. The data collection is driven by research questions. So it's not just let's go collect data for the sake of data. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about why we're collecting this data as an organization. Um, but as a general rule, this is you know, driven by specific research questions that people have. Um, and the data that's being given back to them is helping them come to conclusions, make decisions, those kinds of things. And one of the other features is um, open access data. And this one kind of varies across projects. Some are more open than others. But in general, you know, a wide community of scientists and volunteers are working together to create this data set. And there is generally some sense of sharing that data at the end. Sometimes it's actually, you can actually see the raw data and manipulate it yourself and, and those kinds of things. But a lot, oftentimes it's more uh, making sure that the public has access to the reports that come out from the project. And we'll talk a little bit about some of our results um, as we go through today. So again, we're not, this is not a new thing. Um, 
we're going to focus our efforts on ecological studies specifically because that's what we're doing um, from Wissick and Trails. And we're going to dive a little bit deeper into that. But if we think about some of those historical scientists like Thoreau and um, Leopold, their data is still useful today. Uh, because of the data sets that they collected, current day researchers can actually take that data, combine it with data that's being collected today, and look at changes over time, which is really important when we're talking about biological things and you know what's happened in the past and what's happening now and understanding what's going on in the natural world. So this top graph here is um, a researcher who looked at Thoreau's data on flowering plants um, from Walden Pond and found that that this was published in 2012, but looking about through 2009, on average, the plants in that area are blooming about seven days earlier than they were um, when this paper was published. Likewise, a study, a researcher um, that actually included one of Aldo Leopold's daughters looked at uh, the arrival of sandhill cranes and geese uh, in the area of Wisconsin where they were. And on average, they're uh, when over a 61 year period, they're arriving uh, two to three weeks earlier than they had been when Leopold originally collected the data. And so these kind of studies aren't necessarily giving us the why, but they can point researchers in a direction to help get at that. If we didn't know that these things were changing, we wouldn't ask the questions of why and maybe come to a deeper understanding of what's going on. Maybe it's climate change driven, maybe it's purely weather, maybe it's um, some other resource that say the geese or the cranes don't have anymore because of uh, development and land use um, and things like that. So it can get us to a place where we can start to answer those questions in a more meaningful way. And you can see we're talking about data, you know, collected from 1852 to 2009. That's a really long time. And so when we're talking about ecological studies and biological studies, that time frame is really long. Things don't typically change that quickly. And so to have these historical data sets is really important, but to continue that data collection now and into the future is also really important. So I want you to imagine for a second for another, another thing that community science or citizen science really helps with is the idea of bringing scale to a project in a way that we couldn't really previously accomplish. So imagine a researcher, or maybe a PhD student who's interested in monarch butterflies. You know, they might be at a university and that university might have a couple of gardens around their property that, that this PhD student could study. Um, they might be able to recruit some nearby community members to help you know, or maybe they could get a few other universities around the country involved to study their own gardens and things like that. But now imagine a network of over 250 volunteers with sites all across the United States, um, this wide geographic range that in 2022 alone spent 16,466 hours in the field collecting data on milkweed and monarch butterflies. So you can just immediately understand the scale of this is so much bigger than could have been realized by that lone PhD student. And so this just generates an amazing data set that those researchers can then use to help answer questions about monarch butterfly and further our understanding of them. Uh, and hopefully figure out you know, why populations are declining and what we can do to fix that. Um, or stabilize them, uh, as the case may be. So again, that scale is really important. And that's an important feature of the projects that we're involved in, because one of our goals is that we try to connect to these kinds of national projects whenever possible, so that we're not just operating in our own little bubble of Ambler, but we're contributing to this larger body of science um, so that we can help those researchers answer those questions. The other way that we can look and think about community science is the value of it. And so I found, and um, 
sorry for the age of these. Unfortunately, this is weirdly something that not a lot of people actually look at uh, is the actual sort of dollar value, financial value. Um, but I mentioned earlier on that, you know, the, the data sets from community science are quite high quality. And this research uh, in 2014 actually found that. Um, they, you know, compared scientists, professional scientists and volunteers and on a project by project basis where they had access to the same protocols and the same tools, um, they were reliable as the, you know, the volunteers were as reliable as the data collected by professionals, which is good because then we know we can trust the data that we're getting um, and make sure that we set up our volunteers to be as successful as possible uh, in terms of training and things like that. But we can trust the data that we're getting back as can the researchers that we're giving the data to. And then volunteers contribute in 2015, at least two and a half billion billion dollars annually to biodiversity research. And I'm sure that number is actually much higher because now because the number of projects has just skyrocketed even in the last couple of years. Um, but I can't find a more recent figure. So we're gonna go with at least two and a half billion dollars um, that volunteers are contributing to this kind of research, which is huge and immense, um, particularly for an organization like ours that's small and nonprofit and doesn't have the access to some of the research dollars that larger organizations might have or universities have and things like that. So this is an area that um, really means a lot to us in terms of being able to achieve our goals uh, in the work that we're doing in our area. So, um, I want to talk real quick about sort of what those goals are and, and where community science fits in the larger scheme of Wissick and Trails. So um, our first efforts into community science were really started in 2014 when our Creek Watch program was established. And this is Creek Watchers is really all about uh, water quality and creek monitoring. I'm going to talk a little bit about that um, under the specific project title in a bit. Uh, but that was really the first effort that we had. And over the course of 2015 to 2018, um, the organization added some more staff. There was a greater focus on um, creating management plans for our properties, uh, an expansion of monitoring that happened sort of on a small scale, mostly done by staff. But we did have some opportunities to hire some experts to come out and collect some basic baseline inventories for us in specific things like mammals or plants or um, amphibians and collect that data so we kind of knew where we were starting from. But that's kind of where it ended, if you will. There, there wasn't a great place to go next. And what happened was in 2018, then we created our first strategic plan and as an outcome of our strategic plan, we created these three pillars, which we really see as the way that we can work to uh, move our mission forward uh, in the area. And the three pillars are protect and restore, connect and engage and grow and sustain. And the idea is as an organization, we wanna be working at the nexus of these points so that we're protecting the natural heritage of the Wissahickon Valley, um, that we're connecting residents throughout the watershed with the nature that's around them, and engaging and inspiring people like yourselves to care for the natural world. And then growing and sustaining is about, you know, making sure that we're financially uh, sustainable for long term success. And so the outcome of this strategic plan really drove um, underneath of that was what do we have to do to get there? And so for protect and restore was we needed to write conservation management plans for all of our properties. And so that is an exercise that our conservation team has been undertaking. And I think we have three more to go. I think that's where we're at now. So we're, we're doing well. Um, we've, we've made some significant progress in creating these management plans. And the other part of that is we, um, we want to connect people to the land. And so this idea of being able to engage in community science efforts really brings those two pillars together, where we're using the conservation management plans to guide our decisions, and we're connecting people to the work that we're doing directly by having them help us in the field uh, with data collection. And so 
thus the community science efforts were born and sort of this expanded view of it. Um, our overall community science kind of has these four, five guiding pillars, if you will. Um, we're doing some baseline data collection because while well, we had uh, some expert work done back in 2014, 2015 timeframe, we actually have added new preserves since then and new preserved land. So we don't have baseline data for that. Now we know that um, the things that are on those properties are not likely to be dramatically different uh, than things that were found on the other properties, but still we don't have any baseline data specifically for those properties. So community science can help us get some of that. In standardized is data collection, the idea of using community science and the projects that we're going to talk about in a second, you know, standardizes data collection across all of our platforms, across all of our properties, um, and just gives us that unified view. The idea is to then, um, these next two things go hand in hand. We want to measure changes from our management actions. So if a conservation team undertakes a particular um, project or set of projects on a property that you know, removes invasive species, plants native species, um, changes the habitat in some way to the better, we want to be able to try to measure that and also inform our management decisions in general. So are we making good decisions about how to improve habitats, for example, and what creatures might benefit the most from those decisions? And the monitoring that we do through community science helps us get there. And then, as I said before, one of the other kind of goals and overarching themes is this idea of linking to regional, national, or international projects wherever possible. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One is because I then don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, those organizations already have, those projects have a protocol that we can just adopt and basically become a new site in their projects. And that makes it a lot easier for us because we can follow things that people have already done the hard work of figuring out what the difficulties are with a particular set of instructions or tasks or project you know um, goals and things like that so that's really helpful for us because it just cuts down the amount of time that we have to do uh, in terms of that planning but it also means we have to think carefully about the projects that we're doing to try to make sure that that they're covering enough of the things that we're wanting to cover in our management plans and so um, since this just started in 2019, we're still kind of learning uh, where we need to be and what projects are the most important and um, where we need to move in the future. So I wanna take a quick second to just talk about management plans uh, in a little bit more detail. So as I said, we're developing these for all of our properties. Um, and the idea is that the overall goal on each property is to maintain, uh, enhance, and improve wherever we can biological integrity, excuse me, diversity, and environmental health of that individual property. Uh, so when we look at a property like our Crossways Preserve, which is about 60 acres of land, we take that preserve and we divide it into management units, which is basically just a smaller scale way of looking at the similar habitat in an area. So um, you can see by the colors here, you know, we're talking about all this green area is hardwood forest. Uh, this black and white checkered area here is successional woodland. So this is a younger forest kind of just growing in. Um, we have some wetlands on the property. Uh, over here in the corner. And then we have meadows and we have a couple of different kinds of meadows. We have what we call our managed meadow, which is largely native grasses and wildflowers with a scattering, smattering of a few trees and shrubs. And then we have what we call our shrub scrub meadow, which is much more um, still native grasses, still some wildflowers in there, but much more shrubby and small trees and things like that. And those you know, make very different habitats um, for the birds or other creatures to use. So it just gives us a finite way of looking at the individual pieces. Now, understandably, a bird's not just going to stay in one part of 
the management unit, well, only, you know, only one management unit. They're probably going to use more than one. But that's where we take a look, you know, at the whole and then at the individual pieces so that we can create projects that ultimately make the whole better. And each management unit, without spending a lot of time on this, has a variety of things that we're trying to these response variables. Think of those as goals. So this is what we want to see happen. And then the methods is how we monitor if that's happening. So for example, down here under wildlife response variables, you know, we want to see um, species composition and population trends of forest birds. And we can measure that through our breeding bird surveys, through our MAPS banding station, through climate watch surveys that we do in the winter and the spring. And so we can target specific projects to get at that population trends of migratory songbirds. You know, and, and then part of the plan talks about focal species and species of conservation need. And so we'll outline the, the methods we think can help us uh, get there and measure these changes um, as they happen. Now, I have to say that because this is all relatively new, we don't have a lot of data yet that's like helping us at the decision making level. Um, some of the projects have only been going on for two or three years and 2020 and 2021 were less than ideal for data collection for reasons I'm sure you're all well familiar with by this point. So um, we have a long way to go. And this is why getting more people engaged in uh, participating in some of these projects will help us continue that data collection so that we can get to the point where maybe we are actually being able to see trends uh, because we're not quite there yet for a lot of these projects. And because I know not everybody might be familiar, I just wanted to sort of zoom in a little bit on the map. So our amblers here um, and where my cursor is, our four mills headquarters is in this area of the big dark green. Uh, this is the four mills re nature reserve um, right along the Wissahickon Creek. All of these darker green properties are preserves that we own and manage and the lighter sort of more fluorescent green line here is the Green Ribbon Trail that goes from North Wales um, all the way down into Philadelphia and you can you know keep going on the trail um, along the Wissahickon Creek all the way down into the city of Philadelphia. So we kind of stop uh, at the border of Philadelphia and Montgomery County. So we're mostly operating in Montgomery County and by and large right now, most of our projects are at our Crossways Preserve in Bluebell and our Camp Woods Preserve. But we do have a smattering at our Willow Lake Preserve, uh, a couple up in North Wales at our Dodsworth Run Preserve, and looking to expand uh, at Pezac and Briar Hill. Um, and there are also a few at Army Trout, sorry, I forgot to mention that, uh, which is tucked in here next to um, Camp Woods. So kind of along Morris Road is where a lot of our properties are located. Pezac and Dodsworth are kind of the outliers. So just kind of give everybody a sense of what we're talking about, because you'll see um, preserve names listed on some of the individual project slides. And just really quickly for a uh, project overview. So I'm going to talk about the specific projects in a minute, but I just want to, there will be some, there's some overall commonalities with, with all of the projects and and basically they're outlined here so training will be project specific um, and so some projects require more training than others some will have a virtual training or an in-person training um, and then others will just be you know training as you arrive on site uh, we'll be sort of doing more of a group activity so um, the, i've tried to kind of create project sites that the amount of time required for each site visit is about an hour, but for a lot of the projects, multiple site visits would be required. And we'll talk about those in the individual projects. And the other point that I want to make is this is real field work. Uh, most of these projects require going off trail, some uneven ground, some weather, some biting insects, kinds of things, take precautions, you know, that type of thing. Um, all of which I can give you more information on. None of them do you have to be out in bad weather to do, um, but it may be muddy, it may be wet, you know, there may have been rain and those kinds of things. So there are a couple projects that aren't 
um, quite that intensive. And so I will, you know, point those out uh, as we go along um, so that you can get a sense of sort of what the options are. And I do want to say as well, you can see from the pictures here, um, these are family friendly projects. We have a number of volunteers, families um, with children, and the kids are the one actually doing a, the vast amount of work um, in the, the projects. The parents are there to uh, provide transportation. Um, and that's about it. Um, the kids are actually the ones doing the work. So, you know, your family may, may vary. We have other families where they're kind of all doing it together. So uh, there are options for both. Oh, I just want to show you really quickly. So this is sort of the results of what happened in 2019. Um, and so, you know, we had a Caterpillar's Count project, and we're going to talk about all these 388 surveys done. We tagged 131 monarch butterflies. We had 34 nestlings fledged. We measured 201 salamanders, and we had 770 hours uh, on volunteers. And that was not including our Creek Watch, which actually would have probably doubled that number, um, given the number of Creek Watchers that are out there. So, and I'm showing 2019. <laughs> because 20 and 21 were impacted by COVID a lot. And so the results aren't nearly as complete or as pretty as they were in 2019. Um, but we did still collect some data. Uh, and um, I have a little bit of that in some of the individual projects, but uh, they are all ongoing projects still. So we'll continue to collect data moving forward. So I can check here. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. So feel free um, to put questions in the chat. I will stop uh, a couple more times to um, answer questions and see if anything comes up. And uh, we'll take some time at the end as well if there's questions. So I'm going to start first with this idea of what I've called on your own projects. And I don't want you to think that we're going to abandon you. The on your own just means that really you get to pick the time in which you go out and do the work within the bounds of the individual project protocol. And so the timing for all of those projects um, will be you know, defined where you'll see that as we go through. Uh, but you get to decide within that time frame when you go out. And I do want to reemphasize as we're going through this, you do not need to know anything about these topics to participate in any of these projects. If something sounds interesting to you and you want to learn more about it, hey, that's what community science is. That's one part of it for sure. Um, you know, come out and, and learn about something that you've never learned about before or never experienced before. Maybe you've never seen a salamander up close. Um, and so all of those kinds of things are um, part of the appeal of doing uh, community science, for sure. So, um, uh, saw a question pop up. Before I go on, I will answer this. Are we connecting with environmental science teachers in the public and private schools? Not directly right now, but it is a goal. Um, as I said, our we just got a new um, volunteer coordinator, and having that person, his name's Alex, having him on staff um, will help us to start trying to do a little bit more of that outreach um, because now we have another set of hands and uh, some more help um, to do that kind of thing. So uh, it is a goal um, for sure. And if you are somebody in the environmental science groups and schools and things like that as well, please feel free to reach out to me directly via email and we'll have a chat and see if there's ways that we can incorporate um, your students into some of our projects, because that absolutely would be uh, a long term goal of ours. Um, so these are the projects that we have sort of that on your own um, kind of idea. So we're going to dive right in here and salamander cover board monitoring is the first one. The idea behind this is we go we take um, what we call tree cookies. There's slices out of a fallen tree. So basically we end up with this round disc that's you know a couple inches thick um, and it creates a board that we can then put down on the forest floor. And each, um, each volunteer is responsible for 10 boards. They're all in one site. Uh, there's like sort of two rows of five together. You get equipment kit, 
you'll get absolute training in how to do this, but to look for salamanders and be able to ID them and capture them and weigh them and measure their length and all of that kind of stuff and take some basic metadata, um, soil temperature and things like that. Right now, there's sites at Crossways and Camp Woods Preserves. Um, this project is done March through May and September to November. So the way that it's set up is there's nine day periods and you would have to measure once during each of those nine day periods. If you participated for the entire year for both the spring and the fall, you would make a visit total of 12 visits to your site. If you only participated for the spring or the fall, then it would only be six visits. And those options are available. You, I, you know, I'm happy to have somebody that says, I only want to do it for the spring or I only want to do it for the fall. And that's okay uh, because we do have a limited number of sites and you know we want to get as many people out to do this as want to so uh, it's fine if you only you know want to commit to doing it once um, if you however want to continue to do it or say yeah i want to do it for the whole year um, that's perfectly fine too so there's some flexibility there uh, in terms of you know your obligation so to speak um, Visits take about an hour. Uh, this is definitely one that the boards are off trail for sure. Um, none of them are particularly difficult to get to, um, but they are, you know, definitely natural trails um, and in the woods um, to to find the boards and uh, um, be able to turn them over and find the salamanders underneath. American Woodcock Call Surveys is another one. Um, if you are not familiar with woodcocks, they are a bird that migrate through the area. They may actually breed in the area. Part of this work is to try to confirm whether we have breeders on our property or not. But the males, you can see down here on the right, have this very distinctive, we call it a paint call. And they have a display flight that they use to attract females. They do this at dusk and dawn. but. Um, where we would send volunteers out at dusk around sunset. And they have very particular habitat needs. They like wet woods, they like open edges, and they need sort of open fields to do their display call in the uh, migratory and breeding season. So, excuse me, they're also very difficult to see. So this idea of being able to hear the males doing this pee call is one, oops, sorry, one of the ways that we can determine um, how they're using our properties. And so the idea behind this is to go out literally and listen for that call um, during the breeding season. This happens at Crossways, Armand Trout, Willow Lake, Dodsworth Run Preserves. Um, it's March through May, roughly. March is probably the key time frame here because that's the sort of peak of breeding season at sunset. Um, and so, you know, it's about four to six visits up for the project season uh, each year, and then about 30 minutes each that you're out there. The birds are typically most active about 20 minutes after sunset. And so if you know that, um, you know, you can time it to get there right around sunset and sort of wait for the 20 minutes. Um, and if they're calling, you know, you might want to wait just to see if a few more join in. So, you know, about 30 minutes of visit. Um, this is one that is uh, particularly helpful. And if this is one that you kind of think, hey, that sounds kind of cool. I'd like to see what that's like uh, before I commit to anything. I will be running a series of walks that will be collecting the data for this project at our Crossways Preserve every Tuesday in March. Um, there is a sign up sheet or sign up uh, registration page on our website on wisecontrails.org. Um, it's under events and you can sign up for one walk. You could sign up for all four walks. Um, you know, it's up to you, but uh, they, th those walks will be doing this survey um, at Crossways. There is uh, also, if you're, you know, at all interested, there's on our website, or excuse me, on our YouTube channel as well, a presentation on the Woodcock display um, that I did last week. So you can take a look at that. And in theory, that's training. I mean, if you watch that video, you would essentially be trained in what you have to do. 
um, and what you have to listen for. So again, if it's something that kind of interests you, I encourage you to take a look at the video or come out and join us uh, on a Tuesday in uh, March and maybe we'll hear some of them in person, I hope. So uh, that's that project. Okay, nest box monitoring is the next one. And this is, we have nest boxes at Crossways, Dodsworth, Armantrout, and Willow Lake. And this is going out about weekly uh, between April and August and monitoring those nest boxes for what species of bird is using them, looking for eggs, looking for young, uh, and keeping track of, you know, how many eggs, do all the eggs hatch, do all the young leave the box, and just collecting that data. Um, most of the preserves have about four or five boxes on them. Um, so, you know, it's not an outrageous number of boxes uh, at each preserve to keep track of, so. Um, oh, and I forgot to mention, the the logos of all the, any other organizations down here at the bottom these are the organizations that we're giving the data to um, so cornell lab of ornithology runs project nest watch which anybody could do um, you could participate in project nest watch if you found you know a robin's nest in your rhododendron tree uh, in your yard um, you could submit data on that nest and so we're submitting the data uh, back to them um, on this project, but we're focused specifically on um, the nest boxes. And the nest boxes that we have were originally put out for bluebirds because we have a lot of um, property that bluebirds should, you know, like to live in, uh, habitat that they should use. And because bluebirds are cavity nesters, um, they often struggle to find places to nest because they, they need a box or a hole in a tree or something like that. And so there's limitations and, and they take readily to nest boxes. So uh, we were trying to improve the bluebird populations uh, in the watershed. And I, this is one of the projects I did throw some results in here all the way through 2021. And you can see we have four species of birds that typically use our nest boxes. Bluebirds are one of them. Um, Carolina chickadees, house wrens, and tree swallows are the other. And um, just a couple notes about some of the data here, but you can kind of see, uh, we see some weird changes over time um, in, the, in the data that we're seeing. And partly in 2021, I have to say, we had uh, an Eagle Scout build us some new nest boxes. And so we had, uh, almost double the amount of boxes that we had in 2020. So that's part of the uh, bump in numbers is that there were just more boxes available. So more uh, bird pairs use them. But we're actually seeing a decline in Eastern bluebirds. And we're also seeing a decline in tree swallows nesting. And the reason for that is because of this giant yellow or orange bar of house wren nests. And house wrens are birds, you know, they're native to this area, they belong here, there's, you know, they use cavities very easily, um, readily, as well as bluebirds and chickadees and tree swallows do. The problem is, is that they're very aggressive. And so they will literally kick a bluebird out of the box, they will destroy its nest, uh, they'll do the same to tree swallows. And so you can see we have a house wren problem. Uh, that we need to try to address. And some of that is box type, some of it is box location. Um, so 2022 is gonna be a year of sort of getting rid of the boxes that the house runs really like and moving some things around and hopefully we can encourage the bluebirds to come back. But one thing that was really interesting that we found in 2021 was the fact that we had the Eagle Scouts specifically make us some nest boxes that are more sized for Carolina chickadees. So the hole is actually smaller. And those were immediately used by the chickadees this year. Um, and every single one of them had a nest of chickadees. And they go back to this slide that, you know, we had nests like this, we had nests that had nine eggs in them. Uh, it was incredible. And so we had this abundance of chickadees hatched out of the boxes this year, which is great uh, and shows us that making those, you know, small changes to the boxes 
um, sizing the hole appropriately is really, really useful. So we can take all this data and the learnings that we've had since we've had the boxes up since 2016, we have a little bit more data to build on and we continue to make some of those adjustments um, on our properties and hopefully improve um, the results for the bluebirds and the tree swallows. Caterpillars Count uh, is a really cool project um, that is, it's the idea is looking at a major food source for birds, which is caterpillars, like these two on the end over here. Um, these kinds of caterpillars are what most birds feed their young while they're in the nest. And so other researchers have, you know, determined that a chickadee's one chickadee nest takes like something like 9,000 caterpillars to raise all those baby chickadees in just one nest. So this project is an idea the um, the researchers looking at the question of are there changes in well there's a number of different questions in here what one is what species of trees or shrubs produce the most caterpillars and when um, how does that correlate with bird use um, you know, are there uh, non-native species that, you know, produce caterpillars that birds can use? Uh, and just overall timing, there's a, a idea and, and it's kind of being shown now that um, caterpillars and caterpillar populations are peaking earlier than they did because we typically have warmer springs and earlier summers. And so the caterpillars come out and they're more active and their, their peaks are happening before the breeding birds are getting there. And so there may not be as much food for the birds, which could also be impacting some of the results we're seeing in our nest boxes. So it's all connected. And this is a project um, that researchers from the University of North Carolina are really trying to sort of look at all those things together. So the idea for this one is you would get a, uh, a what we call a beat sheet. And it's basically a wooden frame that has a literally a bed sheet stretched over it and attached. Uh, and you will get a stick and you go out um, to trees and branches that I pre-mark. And there's little tags that hang on them. I have a photo of them later on in the presentation. And you find the tree and you use an app on your phone and you say, I'm at this tree and you whack that branch like 10 times and hold your sheet underneath of it and see what falls off the branches. And the idea is to categorize them into sort of buckets. How many caterpillars? Um, how many uh, beetles? How many ants? And you don't need to know what kind of caterpillar it is. You don't need to know what kind of beetle it is. Uh, the basic idea of being able to tell the difference between an ant and a beetle and a caterpillar kind of a thing is all you really need to know. And Again, this is a project that goes a long time, so mid-April to August, and there's a lot of branches that need to be tested. So for this year, what I'm looking at trying to do is this would still be an on-your-own project, but what I'd love for people who are interested in this to think about is like what month could you commit? So you would go out and do crossways for June or, and then somebody else could go do crossways for July because it's a lot of work for somebody, for one family or one individual or couple to do all the sites for the whole time period. So I'm thinking it's more like trying to get enough people involved so that we could have, people have to only go out three or four times over the entire summer um, to capture the data. So, and then it's about an hour. Um, when you're out in the field. This one really does need to use a smartphone in the field. That's the easiest way to capture the um, data. If that's really prohibitive, you know, there is a paper way to do it. So, you know, we can work with you on that. Um, but the data entry on the smartphone is really the preferred option. Um, just checking my notes and make sure I've got everything. Yeah, okay. Um, Creek watchers, I mentioned earlier, these are stream side visual monitoring, is, is a stream side visual monitoring project looking for changes and trends and things like erosion and sedimentation of the creek, um, algae and temperature changes and things like that. And you would, if you're interested in this project, um, there is training offered. Again, like I said, there's training for all of these. 
we won't just like tell you here, here's your paper, go do for sure. Um, you would be assigned a particular site and that could be somewhere along the um, main stem of the Wissahickon Creek, but we also cover tributaries coming in. So Prophecy Creek and those areas as well. So um, typically it depends on what sites are open, but I know that the person in charge of this tries to assign people, you know, areas close to where they live um, just to make it easier to get out. This is a year round project. Um, volunteers are asked to go out like the third week of the month to collect their data. So everybody's sort of collecting it at the same time, but you can go out anytime during that week that works for you um, once a month. So that's a, um, you know, a long-term project for sure. Um, but one that's really important to us to have boots on the ground and people out there seeing um, what's going on, because obviously, you know, we're as staff, we're limited. We just can't get out and be out there all the time to see all the things. And so having people like you out there helping us do that is really important. Um, Creek Watchers have actually found some um, Um, I'm going to say polluting, pollutant uh, impacts, you know, um, discharges that shouldn't have happened in the creek and things like that. And it was because they were out there monitoring that they were able to see that uh, and know that it didn't belong and notify us so that uh, it could get taken care of. So those kinds of things are really important um, as far as the health of the creek goes. And the last two that are sort of on your own, um, although there are group activities for this, which I will mention in a second, um, are eBird and iNaturalist. So if you're a birder, you may already be familiar with the idea of eBird uh, and using eBird to collect your bird lists as you're out and, and making sightings in the field. Um, iNaturalist is very similar to eBird in that it collects data while you're out in the field. Um, the main difference is it collects everything, not just birds. And so it, you know, salamanders, frogs, plants, um, mushrooms, you name it, you can put it in there uh, as long as it's alive. And then, um, and it requires, you know, sort of proof of the thing. So generally speaking, it's a picture or a sound recording of a bird's call. Uh, whereas eBird, you can just list and say, yes, I saw this. And unless it's something that's really rare, nobody's gonna ask you to provide sort of any uh, proof or justification, which is fine, it works. And, and most people that are using it are providing real data and that's fine. Um, iNaturalist is a little bit more uh, usable in the sense that you actually do have to provide the proof um, that you saw something or heard something. Both are free, both can be used as an app on your phone or your desktop uh, computer or laptop, tablet, whatever. Um, the beauty of these things is that I can track submissions to our preserves and you know, things throughout the watershed so I can see what's going on in a way that I could never do if these things didn't exist. And so I really, really encourage people to use iNaturalist as much as they possibly can because I have projects set up that collect data um, to let us see what's out there and what's going on. I can track eBird data. It's a little bit more difficult. iNaturalist is set up to be a little bit more user-friendly. It's kind of that open data source model that I talked about. Um, so this is one of the projects. This is a project that collects data from the observations that are made uh, throughout our part of the watershed. So that area of Montgomery County um, that we operate in. And you can see this is of all times, um, I just pulled this yesterday, so it's fairly recent, you know, 22,000 observations uh, that have been made, 2,600 different species, uh, 1,800 different observers uh, making these observations. Now, some of this stuff might sound really complicated and have a lot of jargon associated with it. What's an observation? What's an identifier? What's an observer? All those kinds of things. I do not have time to explain all of that tonight. We'd be here all night long. I have a program that I already uh, did on using iNaturalist and how to use it. So that's on our YouTube page as well. So you could go check that video out if it's something that you want to use when you're out. And I highly encourage you. It's, it's loads of fun and it can be 
weirdly addicting to go out there and taking pictures of this stuff and putting it into the app. And if you don't know what it is, the app helps you figure it out. And it's really cool. Um, I love this program and it's a lot of fun to use in the field. And this is something you can do anytime. You can do it in your yard. You can do it in your neighborhood. You know, you can do it when you're out on one of our trails or preserves for sure. Uh, and I would highly encourage that. There is also a group component to this. So every year there is a city nature challenge. Um, usually there's two a year, one in the spring, which is the last weekend of April, and then usually one in the fall, somewhere around September, I think, uh, or October, somewhere in that time frame. Um, the idea is cities comp compete against each other to have the most number of volunteers out for the weekend. Um, that the event is going on to collect the most, the highest number of observations, to collect the most number of species, to identify the most number of species, all these different categories. And so we compete as part of Philadelphia. And so there will be a couple of, of events that I will be holding that last weekend of April. So keep an eye on our calendar. Uh, and this is a good way to come out and you know sort of practice using iNaturalist if you've never done it before. Uh, and I'll be out in the field with you as well so I can answer questions and I can provide any assistance that you might need. So uh, a couple of different ways that you can, can do um, iNaturalist uh, you know, on your own time or as a group activity. And, um, probably have some other iNaturalist projects throughout the year, uh, but certainly um, that last weekend of April will be a big one. So I'm going to stop here. I saw two questions pop into the chat. And if anybody else um, has questions, you can feel free to put it in the, the chat. OK, so what type of local, state, and national databases So, are, is the data being collected and contributed to? So I, as I mentioned, um, the the project names are um, on the bottoms of the slides. So like the nest box data goes to Cornell Lab of Ornithology. Um, the caterpillars count data goes to the caterpillars count project. And I can create reports um, that I can then share um, from our data as it's available. And so the, the idea is yes, the data will be compiled and trends will be shared with the volunteers when it's, they're available. Um, we are still in the building stages of that. So um, looking at the best means to do that, mostly just like, is it an annual report? Is it twice a year? Is it live? live data on our website as an example um, and so kind of trying to figure out what's the best mechanism for that for our capabilities and resources uh, and what's the most meaningful but yes the goal for sure is to um, share that data when we have it uh, and we begin to collect it so oh how many hours would nestbox monitoring um require so it's let me go back to that slide because i forget how i said it here um okay so it's a, a it's about an hour when you're out there um it kind of depends on how fast you walk <laughs> I, i'm not gonna lie because it's it's a matter of getting around to the boxes and in like crossways preserve they're a little bit further spaced apart in arm and trout preserve there just around the main loop of our trail. Uh, and so it's a little bit quicker. Um, and it also kind of depends on how difficult the birds are being in terms of can you actually see into the box to, um, you know, check their the number of eggs. Um, I've done arm and trout in 30 minutes. Um, if you're not as familiar with checking nest boxes, you know, allow yourself maybe 45 minutes to an hour until you get more familiar with it. And this is another one that I know it's a long time frame across the course of a year from April to August. So um, if you are not available to like commit to that whole time, don't don't let that discourage you because there's options for, you know, maybe we can pair two people up. So somebody does April, May and the first half of June and somebody does the rest of June, July and August, you know, and we balance it out that way. Um, and so there's options. Um, don't let that time frame, um, you know, hold you, um, discourage you, I should say. Oh, somebody said the iNaturalist project is only a single weekend. No, absolutely not. Um, and I'm sorry for that misunderstanding. The iNaturalist project can 
do whenever you want to do it. Um, and I'm sort of scraping that data all the time to see what people are finding, what species are out there, what people are reporting. Um, the city nature challenge is just one weekend. And that's kind of a really highlighting iNaturalist. It's a global project for that weekend. So um, it really, it kind of started out as a competition between cities and it's just grown exponentially. And so we kind of really participate um, for that one weekend and make a big deal of it. But iNaturalist can absolutely and should be used whenever you're out and about, um, as in, in my opinion, as much as you possibly can. Uh, that weekend is just sort of the kickoff. Um, okay, question, is there options of these programs for groups such as high school students? Yes, I, I think it, it kind of depends. So one of the areas where I've run into problems with say high school students in particular and school students sort of in general is a lot of these projects, the peak of when they happen is over the summer. And so it's not really like the school, the, the classrooms not going out together. Um, but there are opportunities um, for some of those that that could happen. And I would encourage you, um, if you are a teacher and you're really interested in sort of following, you know, looking deeper into those, um, please shoot me an email and we can talk about it and we can figure out what some of those options might look like. Um, because in theory, yes, almost any one of these projects could be adapted so that a, a classroom, for example, has responsibility for the site or a scout group has responsibility for a particular site for a project um, for the season. Uh, and we can you know, figure out how to make that work. Um, Off-street parking options for all of the preserves. Yes. Yes, all of these preserves. Uh, Camp Woods is a little weird, but it's, it's technically you're not on the street. Um, there's a little cul-de-sac that you can park in, um, but all the rest of them have parking lots that are attached right to the preserves. Uh, March to May projects, can you still volunteer? So for that, if that's specifically the salamander one, it because of the training and because of the equipment involved in that and the expense involved, I'd, I'd rather have somebody that could commit for the whole time. But if you're interested in salamanders specifically, I would say think about maybe for the fall and I can get you on the list, you know, as a um, you know, possibility for the fall um, as at an open site. Um, that one's harder to switch off just because there's a lot more equipment and it's more difficult to train people. Uh, I'd love, to, I really would prefer to train people that could do it for at least the, at least the six times for the one season. So March through May and then um, September to November. Uh, how we sign up, I'm going to get to that at the end. How we, I'll give you all the contact information at the end. Um, oh, besides the Caterpillar count, how is the data typically submitted? So right now, most of it's on paper um, data sheets. Uh, there's project specific. I'm working on setting up um, Google Sheets so that people can enter the data themselves uh, in some cases. Um, and, you know, that's a sort of a project in and of itself. So Maybe that I should add that to the project support category. If you want to help me set up Google Sheets, I'd love to have your help. Um, so yeah, most of it's just on paper that I'm collecting right now um, and then entering the data or having volunteers help enter the data uh, because that also allows for a quality control check um, and allows me to see, again, since some of these projects were new, uh, where people were having difficulty if data was incomplete uh, and getting a sense of why it might be incomplete and how I need to change training um, for that. So, and I think we've kind of got most of that ironed out um, specifically for the Salamander project. So now we're at a point where we can start trying to collect that data electronically. Um, if anybody's an app developer that wants to help us develop an app for any of these projects, I would love to talk to you as well, because that's also another sort of long-term goal and way out of my level of expertise. Um, those are the questions that I see now. So we're going to hop into the two. It's really sort of two um, group projects. Uh, one is monarch butterflies. And we're going to talk about that first. Um, 
Monarch Butterflies is like four different projects in one and they're kind of all connected. So it's really difficult to talk about them uh, and it's kind of confusing, but I've tried to put the, the buckets here. So the first project is really about counting milkweed stems. So that map I showed you earlier of all the red dots and all the sites, we're one of those sites. Our Crossways Preserve is one of those sites. And um, I've, I've been the one collecting the data on this for the past couple of years, mostly because we didn't get this one started in 2019 at all. It, was, it didn't, wasn't scheduled to start until 2020. And then we didn't have volunteers in the field because of COVID. And so I've been sort of doing this um, on my own, but now we're back at the point where we're doing uh, in-person programs in the field. And so this is one that, you know, I can train you um, in the field. If there's enough interest in this and I have enough sort of committed volunteers to come out and help, um, I might actually do a virtual training just to give everybody an idea of what's going to happen before they get there. But in general, these projects are all going to be, I'm going to pick the date, I'm going to pick the time, you come when you're available. And you can come to all the times that it happens, you could come to one of the times that it happens, you could come to some of them, it's entirely up to you. This is a project, this first one that has to happen weekly throughout the growing season. So really we're talking sort of April, May until that sort of August timeframe as well. So it's a long-term project um, a court, over the course of the growing season. It's, and because some sites have upwards of 500 milkweed stems, it's difficult for one person to do the whole thing every week for that period of time. So the idea is, Let's get four or five of us out there. We spread out across the field um, and we each take a little section and then we don't have to, you know, one person's not out there counting 500 milkweed plants and looking for caterpillars on them. But the idea is you're looking underneath of the leaves um, or on the plants for um, baby monarch caterpillars. And there's actually two in this picture. I know they're hard to see, but they are there. These are probably about day old caterpillars. Uh, and then also eggs. And this leaf unusually actually had two different caterpillars on it and an egg. Um, oftentimes there's only one and evidence of other caterpillars actually as well. So I don't know what happened to them, where they went, but they very much look like uh, monarch caterpillar eating the leaves. So this is what it's about um, and looking for what other insects are using the milkweed as well while we're out there. Um, then, and all that data goes to the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project, which publishes their results um, every year. And I will start tabulating, you know, our individual results um, or, you know, our site results like for Crossways. And, and the idea is we uh, count how many caterpillars we find, what age they are, how many eggs we find, how many adult monarchs we see when we're out there. And, then there's a second part of that, which is collecting fourth and fifth instar caterpillars, which are the oldest caterpillars, the biggest ones, and taking them inside to raise them to be adult butterflies. So that's what this setup over here looks like, these plastic containers, um, one caterpillar per container, uh, eventually gets to be one butterfly per container. And the idea behind this is this is part of, it's both part of the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project and Project Monarch Health, which is looking at the incidence of disease and um, parasites in the monarch population. And we don't have time to really go into that in detail tonight. And that's where doing sort of a virtual training specifically on this project um, can explain that a lot more. But the idea is measuring the health of the population and by letting the caterpillars go to the fourth and fifth instar stage, the oldest caterpillars, right before they go into chrysalis, um, they've spent time in the wild, so they could potentially be infected. And then we isolate them so that, that if they are infected, they can't spread that disease to any of the other caterpillars. And then we can test them when they come out as a butterfly um, and see if there's a problem. And so one of the ways we do that is testing for um, what's called OE. It's a uh, disease that impacts butterflies, usually they don't actually survive to adulthood, um, but it's a problem that's 
much more prevalent down in the south where it's humid uh, much of the year and more humid than it is here. Uh, milkweed plants don't die in places like Florida. It stays warm enough all year for milkweed to be out all year round. And so this, the spores of this disease just live in the population and create, can create problems. Um, researchers are tracking whether or not climate change may be driving OE further north and at what rate. So that's why we participate in that project. In addition to that, um, at the proper time of the year, late summer, early fall, when we have tagged or, or raised adult butterflies that can be released and wild caught butterflies um, during the migration season, we tag them um, as part of the monarchwatch.org program that then looks for these tags on the overwintering butterflies in Mexico um, to better understand um, migration, which you know, as much as we know about monarch migration, there's still a lot of things we don't know. And so participating in this project is helping um, fuel that research as well. So again, lots of moving parts on this one. Um, but as I said, for right now, for this year, this is going to be one where I'm going to pick some times and I'm going to try to um, pick a variety of times. So uh, I might have some sessions that are during the day, I, if I, especially if you're available during the day. Um, when I tell you about how to reach out and sign up for things, um, let me know because, you know, particularly if you're interested in this project, um, I might schedule some day sessions, I'll schedule some evening sessions, and I will schedule some weekend sessions so that there's a mix and hopefully a wide variety of people um, can join. Uh, I will say that most of our raising efforts are done uh, in partnership with a couple of retirement communities in the area. And so, um, you know, but if you're going to participate and help count milkweed stems, you would get priority to help do the raising of a butterfly. So to be able to take an egg or a caterpillar home with you uh, with milkweed to, to raise it um, as part of the project. So if that sounds appealing to you, um, I encourage you to try to help. And right now, um, the primary target for the milkweed stems is crossways, although if we have enough interest, it would be great to try to add uh, PZAC preserve to that as well. Um, there's a lot of milkweed out there and we're not doing a lot of work at PZAC, so it would be great to get this project started. In terms of um, collecting wild adults and trying, you know, netting them during the migration season and tagging them, um, that can happen in a multitude of places. Actually, the best place to find, uh, I found to find migrating adult butterflies is our Dodsworth Run Preserve um, up in North Wales. And so a lot of those tagging events uh, may happen um, up there, but they will also be uh, in other places. And what my goal would be, uh, you know, for the milkweed stems, like the other projects, you know, targeting about an hour in the field. Uh, again, some of that is going to depend on, you know, how many people show up on any given day. If there's, you know, 10 people that show up, well, we might only be there for 30 minutes. If two people show up, we might be there for a little longer to try to get through all of the milkweed patch. But, um, you know, I'm trying to say you come prepared to volunteer about an hour uh, and then, you know, we'll have some flexibility around that as well. So, and bee monitoring is a total to be determined at this point. Um, there's a couple different protocols out there. I'm working with um, some, there's a bee monitoring lab uh, that's run by the US Geological Survey, Survey, USGS. And I am working, uh, I've been talking to them to try to figure out what's the best methods for us to use. Um, and which projects are most helpful for us. And that's something that we have to talk about internally a little bit more. But the idea behind this is to um, be able to go out and do a project that helps us understand uh, the native bees on our property. So um, while I know for sure we will encounter honeybees, they are not the priority. Uh, we're more looking at the native bees, um, what species are out there, uh, bumblebees specifically is one that's of interest to a lot of researchers. And so um, trying to figure out what the best 
methodology for us to follow is. Typically, bee, bee projects are done uh, in the heat of the summer when the, the bugs are the most active, so July and August. Uh, and most protocols are like, do it twice, you know, do it once in July and then wait two or three weeks and do it again. And so that's kind of the schedule that we would be looking at, you know, again, this is one I'd set the date and time. And if you could join us because you were interested in it, you know, come out and do it. Um, some of these are fairly simple, like the one of the bumblebee projects is just not unlike iNaturalist. In fact, they might use iNaturalist taking pictures with your cell phone uh, and putting them on the site. Um, for them to identify um, and, you know, down to the species level, uh, if they can, of uh, what species of bumblebee it is. So, you know, I'm still working on this one, uh, but if you're interested in learning more about native bees and, um, you know, participating in that, uh, keep your eyes, you can sign up for that, uh, and I will we'll let you know uh, when we make a decision about what we're going to specifically do. And I know some of you may have seen along the way because we've had, you know, discussions about community science projects for a while um, about vernal pools and frog calls and they were on our projects list from 2019. So, you know, it's possible you've seen lists that they're on. They're not off the list, but they're not as high a priority as they were um, for a couple of reasons. One is they're they're very intensive from our end. And vernal pools are basically, if you're not familiar, temporary areas. They fill up usually with winter rains and snow. It melts in the spring. And there's very specific species of frogs, this wood frog down here on the bottom uh, that will use them, and some very specific species of salamanders that use them. And they're limited in, in when they're around um, and when they're most active. And so, for example, the frog species that use them have sort of this peak of two weeks in the spring. And it can happen in February, it can happen in March. It depends on the temperature, it depends on the weather. And it's really hard to say, go out and monitor, you know, every week um, because even monitoring every Tuesday, you could miss it. Right, it, it's just, that's the way it works. So it's much harder to kind of figure out what the protocol for this looks like. And this is one where there's some groups that are doing like the Pennsylvania Amphibian and Reptile Survey would certainly collect any photos or data that we have on frogs or salamanders, but they're not really monitoring vernal pools uh, and they don't have a program for that. The Pennsylvania Natural Heritage Program um, is sort of collecting information on vernal pools and will sort of certify your vernal pool, but they don't actually have a protocol for how to monitor them. So it's it's been a little bit more of a struggle for this one. I will leave it here and say, if these are the kinds of things that you're interested in, they're probably coming down the road. I just don't know what they're gonna look like. Uh, and they're certainly not gonna be a priority for 2022. Getting some of those other projects expanded like Monarchs at PZAC or starting some bee studies, um, those are gonna be much more of a priority uh, for this year. But these are coming. Um, the other thing that we have is some other tools that actually may help us. So this, I don't know if I said this, this one on the top is a spring keeper. That's what this little tiny um, frog up here is. And we have some other technologies that actually may help us monitor frogs um, more effectively or efficiently than um, having people trying to time when to go out into the field to listen for them. So um, more on that in a second. Okay. Uh, Questions? Oh, so the question is, is the milkweed stem counting only in Wissick and Trails areas? So for what we're doing, yes. Um, if you are outside of the Wissick and Trails area and it's not easy for you to come participate in what we're doing, I, re, let me know and I can point you in the direction because if you have access to um, significant areas of milkweed, either in your yard or, you know, in a property close by to you, um, you can create your own site uh, and, and do it on your own as an individual. And the, the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project has video trainings online that you can watch and understand what you need to do. So um, what we're focused on right now is areas on our preserves. And mostly for the moment, it's 
uh, Crossways, um, ideally Pezac and Dodsworth, uh, because there are two other areas that we know have a lot of milkweed already um, that would be good to monitor, but um, we just need enough people to sort of help with that part of the project. I don't see any other questions right now. So I mentioned project support. Um, this is another area. Maybe, you know, you want to kind of do something to help, but getting out in the field isn't for you. Uh, you're not able to do that right now for whatever reason. Um, there are a number of other things. Like I said, right now, there's still some projects that need help with data entry uh, until we get more efficient, uh, you know, online reporting structures in place. Um, Data entry is still a big part of it um, every year. So these are the caterpillar count tags. I mentioned, you know, each the branches that I mark have these tags on them, and this is what they look like. They all have a different code. Uh, they have the species of the plant on them, and they're literally um, zip tied to the branch loosely so that we're not strangling the branch. But the tags don't last um, over the winter and with rain. And I've tried a couple different methods for protecting them and they just don't last for forever. So pretty much every year they need to be replaced. And that means um, cutting them out of the paper, wrapping them with packing tape and um, punching a hole in the corner so that I can then go stick them on the trees. Um, so again, uh, a total at home project that somebody <laughs> could do uh, if they're you know willing to help uh, with that. This next one is a weird one, but it is a real need right now. Uh, we have these chickadee nest tubes that are made out of PVC. And again, they were another experiment in trying to encourage chickadees to nest. Nobody used them this year, um, but they're bright white PVC. Uh, an Eagle Scout made them for his part of his Eagle Scout project and they're not painted. And so they look awful and they, I'm, I'm, sort of sure that that's kind of why the chickadees, chickadees didn't want to use them this year because they look nothing like a tree. Um, so the idea is to be able to paint the PVC nest tube so that because this is what the tube itself looks like. Um, they're these tall things that stick up in the air and the chickadees, you know, nest up here. Um, so it gets it higher up than typical nest boxes are. And this top piece where this collar is lifts off and then you can remove the the roof pulls off so that you can see in and be able to count um, eggs and nestlings and see how many are in there. Um, but they just, they look like white PVC pipes out there. So we really need to get them painted. Um, this is a project painting PVC, unfortunately, is not the easiest thing in the world, but it's, um, you know, if you have capability to be able to do that and can sand them down and then they have to be wiped with acetone and then they can be spray painted, there's PVC spray paint. So just, you know, to sort of camouflage them and make them look a little more tree-like um, is a very project that's very much needed. And then this last one is audio moth uh, maintenance and data review. And this is a project that's still in its infancy. Um, audio mods are these tiny little data loggers. They're literally a tiny little circuit board that has a microphone and a battery case and a micro SD card holder on them. And they're pro I can program them with an app on my cell phone for what, how much time you know, I want them to record, at what frequency I want them to record. So the idea is they can record bat sounds, they can record frog sounds, they can record bird sounds. And so this may be um, a more useful tool than the frog surveys that we were looking at because these can be out and running uh, throughout the year. Um, they can be put in targeted areas in the spring, you know, or late winter, early spring for, for frogs uh, in areas of, you know, where we think there might be vernal activity and we want to target for those frog species. So we're still learning about this technology. Um, it's, it's not very new. It's been around for a few years. It's kind of um, 
exploded in use um, by a lot of researchers out there. I mean, they make versions of this that have waterproof cases that can go down and, and researchers are, you know, sticking them off the side of their boats to listen to dolphins and whales and a variety of other uh, marine wildlife and the noises that they make. So it's really cool technology. Um, and at the bare minimum, um, help, having volunteers to help go out and change out batteries and change out micro SD cards is really important. Um, right now, we only have two monitors that might get moved around a little bit this spring, but um, ideally, the goal is to have some more. Um, this is kind of a pilot year, and so volunteers necessary to change out batteries, change out SD cards, and then longer term, um, volunteers to help analyze the data. So these things are set to, you know, they're programmed to record either at a specific time of the day. So maybe I want to just set it up to do, you know, a, an hour up till sunrise and then an hour after sunrise. And so two hours a day at a certain frequency to do the, the, um, massive amounts of bird song that happen in the spring so that we can try to identify what species are out there. There are programs that you can put on your computer that you feed that data into that help you identify the species. So you don't necessarily have to sit there and listen to all of the data uh, and you know figure out what species it is. There are programs that do that for you. Um, some are more accurate than others and that's part of the learning for this year and a little bit of the pilot work that, that I'm trying to do. But longer term, that idea of if somebody has a computer that they're willing to put the software on and run the SD cards through and create those data files of the sounds um, and the species list, that would be awesome. And, you know, that would be a, a huge help because I'm sure you can imagine um, the file amounts from these will be a lot. <laughs> uh, if you're recording, you know, say every day for two hours for a month, that's a lot of data files. Um, and to go through all of them and, you know, weed out, you know, the stuff, the common stuff we know, the blue jays and the gray cat birds and all of that kind of stuff to find the species like woodcock, maybe, for example, or um, scarlet tanagers is another species that we're specifically interested in on our preserves. And so listening for those things and, and trying to find those things in the data files would be really, really helpful. And um, again, this is, we're kind of like the bees, it's still a work in progress, uh, but there's definitely opportunities for that. And certainly for the data review piece, this is one that would require no field work. Um, this is one that would be, you know, in the comfort of your own home, um, coming to the office to get the SD cards and, uh, uh, you know, SD solid state drive to put the data on when you're done, um, and then bringing them back to the office when you're finished. Um, that kind of thing. So yeah, it's uh, totally uh, an at-home project. And this is one actually potentially that has uh, possibilities for uh, classrooms as well because of the volume of data that's that's generated and then the, the ways in which things are analyzed. Um, it's sort of automatic, but then you could use that data to create um, graphs and connect that to other things that you might be doing in math classes or, you know, other kinds of science classes and things like that and looking at that data and, and uh, um, trying to draw conclusions about the birds that are out there or frogs or bats or whatever um, the question may be. So there may be opportunities there as well for that kind of thing. Um, okay, so that's the basic program that I have for you tonight. Um, I, I see there's a couple questions in the chat, which I'm going to take them in a couple of minutes. Um, the, if you have questions after we're done, please feel free to email me. There's my email address. It's Christy, K-R-S-T-Y at wisicontrails.org. Um, email me and hopefully I can answer your questions. Uh, if you're a teacher and are interested in figuring out how to make this work for your classroom, reach out to me and we'll figure something out. Um, there are opportunities out there and we can make it work um, somehow for sure. So uh, feel free to reach out to me. If you are just interested in volunteering and don't really have any questions um, or you know want to get on the list to be able to 
uh, hear more about projects like, you know, say the Monarch Project, for example, if you're interested in just being able to be informed of when those dates are, um, go to our website, wishickandtrails.org. Um, on the top of the page, there's a couple of tabs here. If you click on the Take Action tab, the, the top one is Volunteer when it drops down, and you'll go to this page, and there's a Get Started button that takes you to a, a form to fill out. Um, just some basic information. What I, you can click, there's a checkbox to click community science as your area of interest. There is also a separate box for Creek Watch. So if that's one that you're specifically interested in, you know, check Creek Watch. Um, but also you can check community science and then add whatever specific projects you're interested in in the comments field. So what I don't want to do is bombard people with things. So if you're really only interested in salamanders or you're really only interested in monarchs, please let me know that um, in that form by just writing those specific projects in the comments field. And that's the easiest way to sign up. Um, all those forms will go to our volunteer coordinator and then we can make sure to get you on the right mailing list and get you out for training when it happens or let you know the days that the group activities are happening. Uh, and like I said, I'm happy to answer individual questions. Uh, if you have them, uh, just drop me an email uh, and we'll go from there. Okay. Um, oh, okay, somebody asked about the chimney swifts. So chimney swifts is still an ongoing thing. Um, we have, for those who aren't familiar, chimney swifts are a kind of bird. We have put four chimney swift towers, which are basically a very specific nest box for chimney swifts uh, on our properties. There's one at the Waterfowl Preserve in Ambler. Uh, there's one at Crossways Preserve, and it literally just looks like a chimney in the middle of a field. Um, they, so the idea for monitoring of those is still a thing, but there's there was supposed to be, we don't have an easy way to do it is really what it comes down to. We wanna know that the Chimney Swifts are using them, but the idea was there was supposed to be an app that was created and it was being handled more through Audubon. And we were just kind of partnering with them um, to, we helped as an organization put the towers up, but Audubon was supposed to be doing more of sort of the Chimney Swift education and monitoring project. And I don't know where that stands, so I didn't put it in here. Um, I can certainly um, try to reach out with additional information on that, but that's not one of the um, sort of priority volunteer areas for this year. We can have a staff member go out and check to see if any chimney swifts have built a nest in the boxes. Uh, and that's actually probably easier and more direct than having volunteers stand in the field for days on end to see if anything flies into the top. So uh, it's really about efficiency. But we haven't forgotten about the chimney swifts at all. Um, I promise you that. So would I make available supplies for the project, spray paint tags, tape, et cetera? Yes, absolutely. Um, that is the goal of all these things. The only thing I won't provide is a cell phone. Um, any other project supplies, equipment, uh, you know, most project supplies come in a bag like you saw that salamander was all salamander project stuff was all set on top of one of those sort of canvas bags, shoulder bags. Um, and a lot of the projects come in bags like that. And for the painting of the um, the uh, PVC pipes, yes, I would uh, make supplies available for that um, if that's something that you're interested in doing. So um, that's all I have. Um, happy to stay on for a minute or two if anybody thinks of any quick questions. Um, and I really want to thank you for joining us tonight and thank you for your interest in these projects. Hopefully there's something here that kind of um, sparked your interest a little bit more and you thought, yeah, I want to, I want to learn more about that. Oops. Why did I, didn't need to do that. Sorry. Um, you know, learn more about that, come out and help. Um, you know, I, uh, would love to see you out in the field or in a training and uh, yeah, come have you help us. So um, that's all I have for the evening. So I can stop sharing and we can go back. And if anybody has any additional questions, um, happy Thank to answer you. them. Thank you so much, Christy. Lots of opportunity there. Yeah. 
all of the projects sound intriguing to me. <laughs> so if we're interested, we should just email you. Um, the easiest thing to do is to actually go onto our website and fill out the volunteer form because that'll well, give I've us done that already. information. I've, I've done that. So okay, then we have we have that. Um, and if you indicated what projects that you're interested in on I there, didn't. we then you can draw me an email. <laughs> okay, yeah, because I did. I wanted I'll to hear up to the data that's on the form. All right. So yeah, because there's like two I'm really interested sure. in. So I will email you. Perfect. Great. Thank you. This Thank is great. You. Really excited. Okay. And I just want to say thanks to the library for giving us this opportunity as well to get get our our face and our voice out in front of some people that might not have heard about us uh, in another way. So uh, I really Absolutely. thank you guys for that opportunity to partner and stay tuned because I think we're going to have another program uh, in the early summer, June ish time frame on uh, fireflies and lightning June. bugs. Yeah, fireflies. On what? I'm sorry. Fireflies and lightning bugs, uh, fireflies Ooh. and uh, moths, actually a combination, kind of the night insects. Yes. Yeah. Oh, they're Looking beautiful. Looking forward to it. Yeah. And Great. I just Thank want to mention so to those who are still on, um, a really great donation came into the library that we are now cataloging and it's going to be available for loan. It's a birding backpack with binoculars, maps, all kinds of equipment, and it will be available to borrow. And you can use it at Wissick and Trails Preserves. <laughs> Oh, and a question just came in. Yes, the project is, the program was recorded. Um, it will be posted on the Wissahickon Trails YouTube page. Um, so you would be able to view it there. Um, probably, I'm, I'm going to say, I'll send it to the person who posts tomorrow. By the end of the week, it should be on the YouTube page. Okay. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Good night.